All right, welcome to episode 23 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. Her name is Emmy Van Dierzen. And Emmy is, I have the file, it's Emmy Van Dierzen is a philosopher and existential psychotherapist who is also a counseling psychologist. She directs her private practice, Dilemma Consultancy, in London and is also principal of the New School of Psychotherapy and Counseling at the Existential Academy in London, both of which she founded with Professor Digby. She's also developed a philosophical, philosophical therapy based in existential phenomenology. Yeah. Welcome, Emmy. Thank you. Hey, Emmy, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. So if I may, I wanted to start off with a quote of yours, which I found to be incredibly profound, and then ask you a little bit about it. Okay, so the quote is from Dryden's Handbook of Individual Therapy. And so in Dryden's Handbook of Individual Therapy, Emmy writes, the existential approach, which is what we'll be covering today, guys, we'll be covering existential psychotherapy. So it considers human nature to be open-minded, flexible, and capable of an enormous range of experience. The person is in a constant process of becoming. I create myself as I exist and have to reinvent myself daily. There is no essential self as I define myself, my personality and abilities in action and in relation to my environment. This impermanence and uncertainty give rise to the deep sense of anxiety in response to the realization of one's, of one's insignificance and simultaneous responsibility to have to create something in place of the empty, emptiness we often experience. Everything passes and nothing lasts. We are able to find, we are never able to hold on to the present. We are always, we are always no longer or not yet what we would like to be. We find ourselves somewhere in the middle of the passing of time, grappling with the givens of the past and the possibilities of the future, without any sure knowledge of what it all means. So, Emmy, that was such an amazing quote, and uh, when I read that, I was incredibly blown away. It was a very succinct way of putting pretty much the predicament that all of us are in, in life. Hmm. And so, and my question would then essentially be, so what does existential therapy consist of in your understanding of it? And if a client were to sort of ask, you know, why existential therapy? And I guess in contrast to the other forms of therapy, what would you say to them? Well, what you've read out sums that up, really. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. that we're not anything tangible that stays the same all the time we are what we become in relation to what we connect to in the world so if we're going to have a therapy that focuses on what is just in our heads we're going to not really be dealing with everything that creates what's in my head so existential therapy is the therapy of existence it's to focus the therapy on the circumstances and the situation of the person. It's to focus it on the connections that a person has created with their world and to become aware of how that affects the individual and how that can change the individual. So the way I connect myself to my physical world, whether I go out in nature or and constantly in the city, the way I connect to the bodies of other people, the way I connect to myself, to my own thoughts, the way I connect to ideas in the world, all of that is going to define what's possible for me and what is impossible for me. So if we want a therapy that gives us back that flexibility, that contact, that kind of context to our existence, that kind of linking up to our life, then existential therapy provides that. It looks at how culture influences us, how politics influences us, how society influences us, how our friends influence us, how the television programs we watch influence us, how the books we read change us. All of that is what creates those neuronal connections and therefore also the framework of our lives. And if we're going to really get a grip of this consciousness and how it connects to the world, then we need to be prepared to have that broad view and widen our perspective. And that is what existential therapists aim to do. Mm -hmm. Wow, is, is that why you chose existential therapy? Because it seems to be the ground or the foundation of, of pretty much of our lives uh, to, to tackle 
our relationships with each other, with society, with the books we read, with the videos we watch, with the people we connect to. It sounds like you're, yeah, you're, you're uh, at, not attacking, but aiming at the, the root of... Of understanding? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, would you say that when clients do come to see you, that it's because there's some sort of breakdown in their connections with the world around them? Well, it depends. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. there is a breakdown. So if people are in grief, for instance, mm-hmm. they've, they've had terrible losses, then literally what's happened for them is that they feel they have um, imploded, you know, their connections have been ripped away yeah. Yeah. and they feel they're nothing. Their lives have become empty. There, there is no sense of a self left at all because that framework, that network they had created might have been completely connected to that person they have lost or in some terrible cases several people they have lost or indeed to a job or a particular context that people were used to living in like if they have changed countries. Mm-hmm. So when we get disconnected from such important people or objects or situations that can have a devastating effect. So then we need to work on that. Mm -hmm. But there are other circumstances in which people have too many connections, so they're overwhelmed, so they can't make sense of it. They're confused. Should they go this way or that way? Should they listen to this person or that person? What we then find is that they haven't actually created that kind of framework, that kind of network, that carpet, as it were, of connections that will give them a sense of purpose and meaning and a sense of who they are. So then we need to work on how they might want to start that very artistic, very creative work of connecting ourselves to the world in the ways that we think is best. Mm -hmm. Not Mm -hmm. just for us as an individual, but for everybody. Because Mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, each of us is connected to so many different points in the world that all of that together creates a massive kind of work of art that we are all part of right and so we had a guest on before her name is jamie lombardi so she's also a philosopher and she actually argued that there was no such thing as individual success that essentially any form of success is tied in with the environment and with one's community Mm -hmm. So well, she, I noticed that. Yes, I yeah. agree completely. Mm-hmm. And so she essentially stated that for us, she said, you know, for every sort of child that becomes a success, that child had a mother, right, who reared him and sort of who helped him along the way, that they had teachers, that they had mentors. And if you talk about sort of the foundation of, or essentially the foundation of individual success, that it's always based on one's community and one's environment. And I mean, yes. from from my assessment, a lot of times of mental illness is that maybe not necessarily physically speaking in terms of there being a breakdown of one's, in, one's connection to one's environment, but definitely psychologically. They feel psychologically disassociated from their environment. Is that something yeah. that you find? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So mental illness often is to do with people becoming disenfranchised. Mm-hmm. And not belonging anymore, not knowing where they fit into those overall patterns, not knowing what their role and function in society is. As soon as we become disengaged in that way, we we kind of lose our, our dynamic vitality. We lose even that sense that we are in charge of this particular little pocket of consciousness. It is particularly by being connected that that becomes revitalized. So when we keep doing things and we keep walking in a wood and seeing these trees around us or uh, connecting with the sky or with the ocean, connecting with physical objects that we create, connect with the lives of other people, connect with their emotions, connect with thoughts, with dreams, with past history, all of that. The more we do that, the more we keep all of this connectivity active Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. when that stops for some reason and that can stop for many different reasons including physiological reasons or genetic reasons incidentally but when that stops that person becomes 
cast out as it were and when we're cast out and we become isolated and disconnected disenfranchised we start to have a feeling of um, nonsensical living of there being no meaning that's what meaning is the connectivity and when that stops this kind of um, lack of purpose lack of forward movement leaves us in a position that we start to interpret as mental illness because then we start to connect in in wrong ways in ways that make no sense any longer or we start to make it up i did a lot of work with psychotic people during my long career and in psychosis this is what we see we see people desperately trying to spin stories and create some kind of meaningful framework, but it is a, typically a framework that is no longer connected to the people around them. Yeah. So yeah. They, they, are, they become solipsistic, as it were. They become quite cut off. And this is what we then name mental illness. But when we become revitalized, and we become reconnected and we start to get a feeling of exhilaration again that this brain can work and this body can do things and we can have a meaningful role in the world these things change immediately people calm down people begin to see that there can be a movement from the past towards the future instead of this kind of being disoriented and when we stop being disoriented and we find our orientation again and our direction in the world, then we know how to connect and how to bring ourselves back to activity, to meaningful activity. Mm -hmm. So would you say purpose is the key here? It, once somebody establishes their own purpose, they can move out of disenfranchisement towards a meaningful existence? Yes, indeed. Yes, you need to have a sense of where you want to go it's it's you know as heidegger said we all move from being thrown into the world at birth mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. that final moment of our death so we experience that as a kind of trajectory we are always on our way towards a future but when we disconnect and we become disorientated in the world then there is no longer a pathway, there is no longer a future. And very often people we call mentally ill have cut off from their history, they have cut off from their memories, they don't want to remember because it's too painful, and they have also cut off from anywhere they can go or get to. So they're actually in a very sort of um, small space of what we call the here and now, which we think is such a wonderful thing to concentrate on, but actually the here and now is nothing if it is disconnected to the past and the, the present and the future. It, it needs to be dynamic, it needs to be in motion. And so it is that dynamic activity that we need to regenerate for the person. We need to help them do that. Would you say that, so that's interesting what you just said about the here and now. Um, I found in my own personal experience, there was a time when I had, um, when I first come to hear of that concept, that idea. And what happened is, uh, at first it was liberating. Of, uh, you know, concentrate on the moment. You mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to concentrate on the past or uh, be anxious about the future. And for a time I had experienced, mm, at least what I would have considered, um, uh, uh, bliss here and there not consistently but it was an interesting experience however um that's it's interesting what you said um yeah without a without a purpose uh without having something to move uh towards it becomes an escape or at least it did for me in my personal experience which is very interesting i feel like learning about being present to the moment is only one uh, small piece of having a healthy mental <laughs> to have healthy mental health so to have a healthy relationship to time we need to be able to do all of that we need to be able to go back into the past and recall things that matter to us mold them over 
and make new connections for them. So instead of our memories being dead, they become revitalized. We attribute new meanings to the things that we have experienced. We connect them back up to other people's experiences. We connect them back up to our experience now, here. But we also start to think about how that connects us to a future. And ultimately, it's not just about the here and now, the past and the future. It's also about eternity. So it's about how my experience of time in all those dialectical ways, you know, doing this figure of eight, mm -hmm. going from the present to the past, then back to the present, back to the future. You see what I'm drawing? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the figure of infinity. Because when we do this, when we see the connections between the things in the past and the things in the future and the things that are here now with other people, then we're connecting up everything and we get a real sense of eternity. We get a sense of our own experiences, our own learning being relevant to everybody else and to anyone who's ever lived on this earth, as it were. Yeah, wow. And interestingly enough, when it comes to, let's say, clients or patients struggling with PTSD or any sort of form of trauma, any sort of acute stress disorder, a, time, a lot of times what happens is that they're pretty much disassociated from the past and the future and even the present, where they're yep. sort of so zeroed in on the trauma that occurred to them and they can't really put it in its proper place in terms of their memory and even in terms of their own future. And it's interesting because when it comes to existential therapy, it seems like, I mean, what you're saying is that we pretty much, we not only connect people back into kind of the community communities and the society at large, but we also connect them back to the existence of time, which a lot of them seem to be out of place. Yeah, that's right. So we always need to connect ourselves or other people, both in space and in time. Yeah. It's, it's vital. And in space, you know, I speak about the four dimensions. So in space, we need to find our bearings by being aware of our embodiment in a physical world, but also of our relationships with others in a social way, and then to the intimate world that we create in ourselves, you know, where we think about ourselves as individuals, and then ultimately connect it up to the ideas, to the meanings that make sense of all of that. So that again has to happen at all those different dimensions. There's those four spatial dimensions and there's the four dimensions in time. And they all get woven together. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we feel the better as we can visit all of those dimensions and go around it in different directions. Because then we get a sense of control, a sense of being in charge, a sense that the journey we're on is actually a journey that we can regulate, that we can um, be part of, that we can participate in actively rather than passively, and that's really important. Right. Yes. Well, I was going to say, and also feeling important is important because when clients feel like they're disassociated, or just people in general feel like they're disassociated from the past, present, and their environments, they feel like they don't matter. And that sort of brings in existential dread and maybe not even necessarily, maybe not even necessarily existential dread in terms of the fear of death, but definitely ruminations over dying in the sense that they already have experienced a spiritual death. Mm, yes, that's the sense of implosion again, you know, when people lose track of how important it is that they make something good of what's been given to them, you know, this is precious what we are, this is a source of awareness that we can learn so much and do so much and move on all the time, but when all that is lost, then people start to feel that it's meaningless, it's trivial, and they give up and there is nothing worse than a human a good human being yeah, who gives yeah. up on themselves or on the world or indeed on life when they become suicidal that that is something that that hurts me deeply when i see people throwing themselves away like that and disconnecting from what they are capable of being losing track of their own potential, of their own possibilities, and indeed losing track of their duty as a human being to take it seriously and to make something good out of what they've got.
And so as a cognitive therapist, I often, Alan and I often discuss this, how our beliefs essentially hold us back. And so mm-hmm. our beliefs for kind of for our listeners to sort of, um, to kind of revisit this issue. So our beliefs are essentially the foundations of all of our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They pretty much underlie everything that we do. And so I came across a statement of yours, Emmy, and I wanted to ask you some of your thoughts about it. So mm-hmm. you said, um, you mentioned, you said the aim is to search for truth with an open minded, with an open mind and an attitude of wonder rather than to fit the client into pre-established frameworks of interpretation. So we kind of tend to do this, right? We sort of box ourselves and box other people in into these sort of different conceptions of who we think we are and who they are. And in a sense, they certainly hold us back. And I wanted to know, Emmy, what did you you mean by this statement in terms of pre-established frameworks interpretation? And how would you see them as barriers Uh, to well-being? Well, this is the thing about existential therapy, that we we used a phenomenological method, which mm-hmm. means that we investigate where a person actually finds him or herself, you know, where they are, what their connections in the world are, rather than to interpret where they are by the standards of a particular framework of reference. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. instead of saying to a person, what's happening there has traumatized you, I would find out what it is that they think has happened to them and how they think that has transformed their world and how that has transformed their own sense of who they are and in what way that is positive and in what way that is negative. Because what I've learned is that sometimes I make judgments about that. I think, well, this is a terrible thing. You know, this person has lost... Um, their partner of 50 or 60 years and then the person says to me but actually there is a great sense of relief at it too and when I dare set aside my own prejudice that each of us who loses a partner of that long a time Mm -hmm. will be in mourning and will be eaten up by grief when I set that aside and I can truly be there with the person to explore what actually they are experiencing and how they're actually computing that and how they might you know do something with that that is best for them then i meet the person who where they are and as they want to be rather than as my imagination tells me then they should be or that they probably are because of the theories I have read and my previous experiences. Right. And that helps them to feel understood by you when you meet them where they're at, um, right? I don't think it matters that much whether they feel understood by me. Hmm. What, what matters is that I can facilitate them understanding themselves and the position they are in. And that is always my objective. It's not for my understanding to be so great, but it is for my interventions to help this person to actually look at themselves, maybe for the first time ever, and to get this much wider perspective on themselves and therefore get a real grasp of who they are and where they are and what is happening to them and what they want to do with that and where they want to go from where they currently are and when they become focused not on me or our interaction but on this amazing exploration of their life and everything that they encompass as it were they become fascinated with that and they realize that they can be philosophers psychologists, researchers, they can research their past, they can really go out on a limb and discover what's happening in their present now, in their world, and they can also become, you know, uh, intrepid travelers who go find out what lies ahead and where they might want to go to next. So that adventure of them exploring the whole story of their lives and the whole circumstances and the whole context and connection, connectional, connective framework of their life, that is when you see miracles happening. 
Wow. And it seems wow. like your approach is fundamentally different from psychoanalysis, which is very dogmatic with respect to their interpretations. Yeah. Yeah. So I was trained in psychoanalysis in the early 70s. <laughs> My first training in France was in Lacanian psychoanalysis. Oh, wow. And I still find it difficult to set that aside completely. It's always there for me. So I'm always listening to the words people are using, and I immediately get, you know, a sense of what that might mean or how that might be slightly twisted into meaning something different. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. of course, speaking many different languages, I get this horrible sort of connectivity between different words in different languages. And I'm so tempted, so tempted to impose my own playful poetry on the other person or to be clever about it. And I have to constantly hold back from doing that because what matters is that they discover the connections that are valid for them, not the ones that come into my mind. Although sometimes it might inspire me to explore something in greater depth. It never is true. What is true for me is never quite true for the other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if I cannot be modest about that and I cannot cipher myself away, then I will never make room enough for the other person. And what therapy is about for me you know, that's what therapy means. Therapeo in Greek means to serve. And so to me, a therapist is a servant. But we're not the servant to the psyche. We're the servant to existence itself. So we serve the possibilities that existence can open or close for us. And what we aim to do is to liberate this other person to rediscover that existence in a way they've never known it before, never felt it before, never experienced before. And by doing that, to just turn their lives inside out, open them up to so many new connections in the future. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And th this reminds me of that Viktor Frankl quote from Man's Search for Meaning when he said something along the lines of it's not so much about what we're looking for from life, but what life demands of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of that yeah. one. That's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, life is calling out to us. And what we do is that we get so scared, we kind of hide away in our heads and we say, oh, whoa, me, I can't take this, or this is too challenging, or, you know, we run away from life all the time. And in fact, when we turn towards life, then we can hear life making demands of us, but also life offering us gifts. And that is what's happening all the time. And when people open their eyes to that, they start to see that. They start to see that in every day, there's so many opportunities that they would otherwise just have squashed. They would just not even have noticed if they are just so preoccupied with self or so worried about events that are on the horizon. You know, when you stop worrying about that and you stop listening to life, then it's just full of these gifts that we it's like a tree you know that is in fruit and all these fruits are there for the picking but if we're not looking then we don't see them so we don't pick them <laughs> yeah and then so there was something that alan said earlier that i wanted to focus on so i just wanted to really quick for our audience read a quick quote from emmy so emmy says so she says many people avoid authentic living because it is terrifying to face the reality of the constant challenges failures crises and doubts that existence exposes us to mm. and alan was mentioning earlier about what he was thinking about freedom and sort of what that meant to him do you remember what you were telling me before yeah so um i i remember the work of sartre uh, right that uh existence uh, precedes essence that uh, we come into this world um, and we are ascribed meaning by society by uh, authority but um, but that you know, that authority is just like us right and that's what Sartre was saying in his work that they're no more in charge of what 
meaning is than than we are. Right. Therefore, we have this freedom to this abundance of meaning that we can ascribe to our own lives. Now, yeah. I know that. Yeah, I, but I, Sartre also said is that we are so scared of that freedom, mm -hmm. and you know, Fromm wrote a nice little book about that too, Fear of Freedom. Yeah. He really got that. And Sartre said, we are so overwhelmed by all the possibilities that we've got to narrow it down. And the way we narrow it down is trying to forget that we have freedom and pretend that we are just like objects and we are just so. And this is what Sartre called bad faith. You know, we pretend that we're only this person or we're only capable of that or that our biology or, or biology or our genetics is limiting us in so many ways. Now, of course, there are limits everywhere too. Yes. But there are actually so many possibilities amongst the limitations themselves that the sky is pretty well the limit as to what a person can do. So if we want to have that openness to our possibilities, we can. But most of the time, we don't do that. Because if we have too much freedom, then we become kind of drunk with it and we become anxious. Freedom leads to anxiety. The opposite of freedom is identity. Identity comes from knowing what you are about, knowing where you're going, and knowing how you want to define yourself. And defining yourself is about limiting yourself. So when you choose a certain identity, even if you choose the identity of mental illness and you say, you know, I um, have post-traumatic stress disorder or I have um, ADHD or whatever else label you want to take. That is reassuring. That's why people want these labels. It tells you something about your limits and often people find that reassuring. But actually, to dare to be more authentic is to face up to the possibilities. What, what Heidegger said about that is that to be truly authentic is not about you. It's not about being true to yourself. It's about being true to life. And the trick here is that being true to life is being true to death. So to be authentic is to face up to the fact that we will all die. And to face up to the fact, as Jasper said, that we have limit situations all the time. That every time I open my mouth, I say something not quite in the way that I wanted to, you know, I'm mm -hmm. fallible. So I constantly have to own up to my own uh, aging process, to my own mistakes, to the ways in which I harm other people without wanting to, to the way in which life is forcing me to earn my keep by laboring, getting up in the morning, you know, doing hard work, all of those facts of life we try to forget about because they're uneasy, they're not pleasant things to remember. But the reality is that the more we can face up to them and open our eyes to them and stop fearing them and taking them into our stride, the more we can actually then find where those connections are and connect to things. So authenticity is about openness to life and that means openness also to the negatives of life. It's about facing up to the paradox, I always say. It's about seeing the positives and the negatives both. Seeing the past and the future both and every variation in between so authenticity is never possible because none of us are godlike and none of us can do all that all of the time so we're constantly failing too and that also is part of our humble authenticity you know to realize that we're only a small part of things and we don't have to take responsibility for being the be-all and end-all of life. We just do our little bits and we touch off little sparks of life that other people can take something from 
and then other people spark off some things that we can take something from. And when all that works out together, that feels good. And that's really all we need to know. So that authenticity bit is can be quite a trap, I think. Yeah. Hmm. Why? Because it can. It's an, another identity. Like I am this authentic person, and yes, uh, yes, ooh. and that becomes very fake immediately. You know, anybody who starts to pretend to be authentic is quite unpleasant, <laughs> superior. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it it's not right. You know, that's false. And also because if we feel this obligation to meet these high expectations for ourselves or other people's expectations, then we can't be free anymore. So de facto, we have stopped being authentic the moment we try to imitate authenticity. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and my thought was in terms of just the kind of clinical spectrum or the clinical field, it's interesting that sometimes people actually do that with their diagnostic labels, where they pretty much hold on to them as, um, well, just to kind of go into Irv Yalom and something he once said is he said that essentially there's a kind of groundlessness between beneath our feet. Mm -hmm. And so we're terrified of freedom because of it, because it's pretty much up to us to create the blueprint for our lives. And the a lot of times, I mean, Emmy, I don't know obviously what your thoughts are on the DSM essentially, but a lot of times people use these diagnostic labels as a blueprint for their lives. They say, oh, well, this is what I'm supposed to be like, so I guess this is what I'm going to be like. Whereas though, technically speaking, they're in therapy to get treatment for these labels, not to necessarily find sort of acceptance of them and to continue to maintain the behaviors that are, let's say, ascribed to them. Yeah, that's pretty ironic, isn't it? Right. <laughs> Well, existential therapists steer clear of those labels altogether. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in my book, Everyday Mysteries, a sort of at the end bit, mm -hmm. I have written about all those labels and how people who have those labels or have accepted those labels or have been had those labels imposed on them are actually in the world. So I'm much more interested in understanding how a person is dealing with certain challenges in the world than in labeling their personalities or their characters or their psyches. I don't think it's helpful at all. And in you know the first eight years of my career, I was working in psychiatry with you know all these labels mm -hmm. on a daily mm -hmm. basis. And I discovered very quickly that most people end up being given a dozen different labels over their career in mental illness. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are these constant conversations about, you know, whether this person is psychotic or borderline or neurotic. Or, it's meaningless. It doesn't help us give this person a, a handle on where they are and where they are stuck in the world, you know, it's like they've become snagged up in a certain place in life. And what we need to figure out is why they got snagged up there, why their life has stopped being fluid, and how we can get that river of life to flow for them again, and how we can get them back into being able to being more than just this little bit of themselves, this little part, being in this little part of the world where they have become temporarily stuck. Yeah. And what I love so much about existential therapy is sort of pointing out to clients about the different givens of existence. So sometimes what happens is like, let's say a client will come to see me and, you know, sort of we go through the sort of cognitive therapy spiel Well, I will teach them about the different distortions and how to challenge the distortions. And one of the first things they tell me is like, oh my God, I do all of these. And I'm like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm like, that's okay. You're supposed to. I'm like, you're a human being. So I kind of try to point to them that even though you have this particular label of, let's say, major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety, the distortions that are associated with them are actually human distortions. That even if you experience them, let's say, more frequently, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are other people, majority of other people don't. I say that we all experience them. And so what I loved about existential therapy is the normalizing of these experiences. And that we can say that these are the existential things that all of us experience as human beings and that you're not unusual in any sort of absurd way. Yes, well, that's right. And not just should we normalize it, but we should also recognize that a lot of those things have positive elements to them. So it's crucial for us to be able to be 
depressed or to grieve or to actually, you know, experience any of those things. There, there are cutting edges to each of those things that can be very liberating if we learn to accept them rather than fear that this is all we are or this is what we have to do all the time. Yeah. yeah. So I have an interesting question. Um, how helpful do you think it is to teach patients or just people in general um, mm. concepts like... I don't know, as an example, either uh, what nuanced thinking is or in, or something along the lines of uh, uh, that we project our realities onto life or onto other people and that, that um, colors our interpretation. How helpful do you think it is to teach people that rather than, I suppose, just concentrating on their connections with other people and their um, other things in life? Or do you think both are important? Both I'm, I'm a great believer in learning, so I think the more information people can gather for themselves and the better things get for them. So yes, we will have a conversation together and if as part of that conversation we do speak about things like that, then you know, I might recommend some reading a person might want to explore. I'm not going to sit there teaching them stuff, but I might say something like, some people think of that as projection and, you know, this is what happens. But if you're interested in that, you might, you know, have a look at this. Or it's, it's about teaching people that we don't hold arcane information that is secret and that we don't share but we rather want to be their companion in an exploration that helps them discover that there are many ways in which they can make sense of the things that have gone wrong in their lives or that there are many pathways they can explore themselves in order to get the hang of things and to get better at this thing called living. And of course, you know, we have studied all these things and they have been essential sources of information sometimes for us to comprehend things and to get better at understanding what's going on in there or in here or, you know, in our lives. So why deprive others of it? But there is a difference between encouraging people to search for themselves or to sit there and say, this is how it works. Yeah. Right, because if you tell them, oh, this is how it works, uh, they may not be as likely to, I suppose, put into practice what it is that you may be saying, espousing. Set yourself up as the expert and you're telling them what's what, rather than reminding them that their being, their consciousness, their capacity is every bit as good and as great as your own. Mm. And they don't need you. They, all they need is what they've got already. And that capacity for investigating, researching, finding out, curiosity, wonder, um, discovery, new experiences, all of that is so much part of going beyond where a person is currently stagnating. Yeah. So give them back the will for that, the wish for that, the desire for that, you know, that curiosity, that sense of childhood wonder. <laughs> oh, isn't it amazing? Gosh, we can actually figure it out. Isn't it wonderful? We don't have to be stuck with one way of looking at things. We don't have to stay in this position where everything feels awful and complicated and impossible. There are other ways. Mm. Yeah, and something I've written about and focused on in the past is kind of sort of man's lust for fame and sort of the lust for adoration. And so, I mean, for you, I mean, this is something I really wanted to ask you because one of my kind of, I guess, clinical idols is Artie Lang. So, I, I mean, I've never obviously met the person and I don't know that much about him as a human being, but I thought his work was phenomenal. 
And I wanted to focus on something you said in regard to him. You said fame, I knew from observing him in relation to Artie Lang, corrupts as badly as power or money. Too much light shining on you blinds you and weakens you. So I was wondering, this, how did you think of this or how did you see this in the context of knowing him? And also clinically speaking, where would the focus lie if the client were to tell you that this is my purpose? My meaning of life is fame and sort of accolation or adoration and accolades and hierarchy and sort of power. Yeah, well, thanks for that question. That's a really interesting one. So I realized, you know, I was quite interested in this. I. I read Lang's books at the end of the 60s and the early 70s and I thought, well, this is the guy I want to work with. You know, I was attracted by that flame of fame, as it were. And I gave up my whole life in France to come to, you know, I sold up a lot of stuff to come to London to work with this man. And I realized within a very, very short time when I saw him give a lecture called The Dialectics of Helplessness, where he walked into the room with his pupils sitting at his feet and where he was, you know, he looked desperate. He looked like a lost person. And I thought, he's out of sync with himself. He's out of sync with the rest of the world. He is speaking from a, a great height as if he knows more than other people and as if he has to sound really wise or pinpoint everything perfectly and of course he was going to fail miserably at that so that was point number one i could see that he was failing at living up to his own fame and i was deeply disappointed in him straight away and then i realized that also he was being persecuted by so many people and was being attacked by so many people that he became very sharp with people and quite negative and quite hostile often and unpleasant even. You know, he drank too much, he took many drugs. He was often not really responsible for his own impact on other people. And I thought that was a terrible thing to do. And later on, I noticed this was true for many other people who become famous. They start to become like great divas and they think that different rules apply to them. But it isn't true. Nobody is above humanity. We're all connected at the same level. And it is hugely important not to get blinded by one's own success. So I have tried deliberately to undermine my own success at various points. And at the points when I was, you know, most on the edge of that, I've never been famous in that way, fortunately. Mm -hmm. But when I have been nearly there, I have often espoused causes that were unpopular or that challenged me or that made me have to go sideways into something broader rather than building this kind of t this kind of tower that becomes so narrow at its base that you know it's going to collapse eventually so that's what i believe you have to do with money if you have too much money then you have to spread it around rather than sitting on it if you have too much fame then you have to use it for a good cause you have to do something with it you have to you know recirculate it again if you hog these things and you hold on to power money or fame you'll collapse into it it goes wrong yeah. Do you think that that's inevitable or do you think that somewhere down the line maybe the person has the realization of, well, I mean, if connection is obviously one of the fundamental, I guess, aspects of life and of mental and emotional well-being, then maybe I actually do need to spread the fame and the money around. Do you think that? So my question but, is, yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, you can watch people doing it. There's some people who are quite remarkable about that. They, they know that they have to start working for charities or they have to become a advocate for groups that, that are poorly or, you know, people do these things. They discover that this is important. And of course, you know, then they become less famous, but they actually use their fame for the good. And, and that's a wonderful thing to behold. But when people hold it to themselves and they become burned by it, I find that very sad indeed. Yeah, and it seems like greed itself is just the antithesis of mental well-being. 
That it's like when you're isolated and disconnected, there's just no way for you to ever find happiness, no matter how much you accumulate. Of course not, because you become different to everybody else, so you become isolated. It's like mental ill health, yeah, by well. definition. Mm -hmm. you, you, you paint yourself into a corner. It's scary how insidious the, the ego can be, because there are people who, I'm sure with maybe in, even in Lang's case, at one point, before he became famous, it's possible he was profound, this just this amazing person. No, he even was when he was famous, by the way. Yes. No, I understand, even, but... Even during that time, you know, when he was in a very private situation or when he was suffering, he suffered a great deal in his own life. He was a very open person and a very intelligent person. He was still a very special person, don't get me wrong. Mm. But he let it get the better of him. He didn't keep track of all the different things that matter to get right in your life. And, and that's a shame. But lots of people get things wrong. We all get things wrong. And then, you know, we can learn from what the other person has done wrong, can't we? And that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, as I hope other start? people will learn from the mistakes I've made in my life. <laughs> no, 100%. I mean, there may be even phases that we go through. Like, uh, for instance, I I've been um, not necessarily full of myself, but I've had a an identity before where, um, you, you mentioned it actually briefly before, where you're speaking from this high place, uh, mm -hmm. teaching people, thinking you're the, this possessor of arcane knowledge. Mm -hmm. It wasn't exactly like that, but it was. that was what my behavior was like at, at one point or another. This was years ago. But thankfully, I, I can say, you know, I would like feedback, of course, from Leon here, if anything. <laughs> but I think I've come out of it. If no, no he's a good no. guy. He's a good guy. He's <laughs> here. Good for you. We, we all go through phases like that, you know, between having no ego at all and feeling frightened of everybody and not being able to even speak up for yourself or being too full of yourself. It's a balancing act. Mm. And we need to be able sometimes to be really humble and modest. And sometimes we need to know that we have some experience or we have something to contribute to the world and we need to have enough ego to push it forward and not let ourselves be bullied or dumbed down by other people. Both of those sides are important. Yeah. And what would you say, I mean, outside of obviously his maliciousness or Ronnie's like really good or redeeming qualities? Oh, he, he was incredibly good at resonating with other people. Mm -hmm. And he certainly helped many people who would have been lost to schizophrenia. Um, he inspired so many people, you know, to think about mental illness in a different way and to question these diagnoses or to question the idea that medication was going to be um, the savior of people. He gave many people a chance to do without that and have the courage to rediscover what they were capable of being. I, I came over and, and worked in a, a therapeutic community with the Arbus for a year and worked at their crisis center. And I got to know some people that had come out of mental hospitals where they had been for years and years and they refused to take any further med medication. Wow. And we struggled together through this mad feeling they sometimes had in order for them to be able to reestablish themselves in the world. And these things would not have happened without somebody like Ronnie Lang giving that example of how that could be done. So we owe him a great debt of gratitude for that. Yeah, and there's this really interesting form of therapy for various psychotic disorders where you would essentially teach the client to respond to their voices. And so it's based on something called the Hearing Voices Movement. And I think it was founded in New York City. I'm not 100% sure. But I mean, I can tell you from personal experiences that the results have been pretty, not amazing, but they've been actually pretty good. So if we kind of just normalize the voices for the client. And so as they respond to the voices and create a dialogue with them, they can actually make deals with them. And so it's like well, the voice... It's it's not quite as simple as that mm -hmm. because, of course, there are people who have voices 
that they can recognize as benevolent mm -hmm. and that they can create a relationship with. And there are indeed many people who have those without ever having thought that they were mentally ill. Yes. But there are also some people, let's not get, you know, um, overexcited here. There are some people who hear very scary voices mm -hmm. that really are very attacking. And it can take many, many years before they're even willing to listen to those voices, take them seriously and engage with them. So it's many different possibilities as usual. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, making a relationship with the voices and engaging with them and being brave enough to face even those more aggressive aspects of life is exactly what it is about. It's exactly what we were saying earlier. It's being able to work with the positives and the negatives both, but never to think that it's going to get easy when we do that, because that is a big challenge to stop taking medication and to start facing up to one's own murderous feelings, for instance, that create those voices that is a very hard thing to do. And it takes many good therapists to persist with you through that process too. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't now want to work in that way. I would not want to live in a therapeutic community where for 24 seven, I would be available to people's murderous instincts, their suicidal instincts, their various uh, bad habits and um, you know coming waking me up at all hours of the night I just wouldn't want to do it anymore yeah, you yeah. know sitting with somebody through a manic episode and I will use that word because we all know what we mean when we use that word and actually sit with them with a team of six or seven people through a period of two weeks until they come down from that without using any medication that is a wonderful thing to do for that person because, you know, they'll never be the same again. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot out of the therapists. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't become a method that is very widely spread because of that. It's hard. Yeah, most, yeah. most definitely. And did you go? I, I have a strange question. <laughs> you, you sort of, uh, you did sort of answer it, but I'll see what you say. So... What would you say if somebody attempted to disregard the voices in their head, in the sense that um, the ones that come to them automatically, not not a not a brainstorming sort of voice or a critical thinking sort of voice, one that let's say maybe uh, let's say something negative that comes to you almost automatically, say they attempted to disregard that as not them, let's say, even yeah. even though it might be a strange way to put that. It, not, a that... not at all. You and I both know this. You know, I'm sure you, like myself, have been in a situation where you're trying to hang up some pictures and you're hitting yourself on the thumb and then the next one you do, you nearly do it again. And you say out loud, you idiot to yourself. That's very close to somebody actually hearing a voice saying to them, you idiot. And when that becomes habitual and a person lives with an external voice that whatever they do keeps shouting, you idiot, then they may need to do that. Before they own that voice, they may need to put some distance there first. So they may want to say, that wasn't me. That is a voice, that is the voice of my father who always criticized me. And he is trying to get into my head Whenever I try to do something positive or creative or enterprising, there he goes again. He says, you idiot, this has got to stop. I'm not an idiot. I'm a good person. I'm a capable person. I'm going to tell this voice to shut up and leave me be. And to have that interaction with the voice can be every bit as positive as to have an interaction where you, you own that voice and you say, oh, that was really me saying that to myself. But, you know, I don't really want to judge myself like that. Sometimes it's easier to first do the, you know, alienation and to say, stop. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the problem 
uh, not the problem, one obstacle someone may encounter while owning that voice is they may become identified with it, or, yeah. No, certainly. We yeah. become very identified and we become hung up on things, you know. Even the negatives are things we we kind of hold on to, you know. For a very long time I was being told, you know, all the freckles on my face made me ugly. And I, as a girl, I had to hold on to this idea that I was ugly because it liberated me from having to become a pretty girl who would give in to boys or who would not stand up on her own two feet. So I was quite committed to the idea that I was ugly for a long time. And it took me many decades to accept that I was every bit as pretty as every other person and that I could claim my own beauty as well as recognizing that it is flawed in many ways. Both those things are true and to own all of that is where we become malleable and flexible and much more aware of you know, our own facilities, our own abilities, our own competency. Wow, wow, I, wow. Uh, okay, and so, and that's actually a really good segue into my next question. So, and another thing that you said, which I thought was really, really super important, was that living authentically begins with the recognition of one's personal vulnerability and mortality, and with the acknowledgement of the ultimate uncertainty of all that is known. So, my question would be for you, I guess, in terms of authenticity and in terms of accepting one's vulnerability, and I guess, you know, kind of quote unquote perceived weaknesses, how important is that, do you think, for a person? person's sort of sense of courage and sense of themselves to accept themselves in their sort of weaknesses as they are. Absolutely essential. Yeah. Absolutely mm -hmm. essential. we got to get away from this idea that we have to be perfect or that we have to be strong all the time or that we have to be good at everything we, we do. The vulnerability is where new things happen, you know. In our vulnerable moments, we, we well up with this kind of liquidity in ourselves with the openness towards things that are difficult and things that are threatening but also to the nothingness in life that gives us our freedom back so to know that we are vulnerable also of course connects us to other people's vulnerability so that is the sine qua non of our humanity yes. If we become perfectionistic and we want to present ourselves as so wonderful all the time, I said before, nobody will like us or love us, but far worse than that, we stop our own capacity for loving other people because love is essentially about perceiving another person's weakness and vulnerability as well as their strength. It is about seeing the reality of the other person and completely welcoming that reality into the world and facilitating that reality so that it can become stronger, more vibrant, more real, more present in the world. That is what love is. Allowing each other to take our space in the world and become present in the world. But we can only ever fully take our space in the world if we do so with an awareness of the emptiness and the vulnerability inside as well as our courage and our strength and our talents. All of that has got to be there at the same time. Wow, I'm like on cloud nine. <laughs> that is so Same amazing. <laughs> I think that's, I mean, obviously, I mean, we want to be mindful of your time. So I think that's a really great point to kind of end it at. Do you have any yeah. questions, Alan, before we go? Well, yeah, I want to ask uh, if we wanted to find you on, let's say, social media or online, uh, where could we find you? Right. So on Twitter, you can find me at M-E-Z-E-N, E-M-M-Y-Z-E-N. Or if you just want the professional me, at Emmy Van Dersen. <laughs> you can find me on Facebook. I have set up uh, a group for existential therapy on Facebook, which you're very welcome to join. Oh, awesome. Absolutely. You can find me on YouTube, Emmy van Dersen, and I have done some clips on existential therapy, but also some political things when I do some uh, human rights work. Lots of different things. 
Oh, and I mean, I just kind of for our audience, can you tell us a bit about your causes, your human rights causes? Well, at the moment, I basically work with EU 27 citizens in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, that's three and a half million of them and one and a half million Brits who live in Europe, whose rights have basically been taken away um, with the Brexit situation. Mm -hmm. So these are five million people who have been treated as second-class citizens who no longer have freedom to m live the lives they do, who won't have voting rights anymore, who won't be able to have their parents living with them if they are sick. All sorts of weird things that have happened in the UK as part of this Brexit business. And so I have worked very hard over the past three years to support some of these people because interestingly, this has led to them becoming acquainted with the experience of mental illness where they never before had that. So when that political situation has oppressed them, they have started to feel incapable of sleeping, incapable of eating, incapable of feeling secure, incapable of feeling cheerful. They have become, you know, anhedonic. They are in a different state of mind. They have become desperate and some of them have become suicidal. All of them, for one reason alone, not because they're mentally ill or because they have had mental health problems in the past, but because the politics in their country has narrowed their lives down and compressed them. And this, to me, is proof that this is how mental ill health is generated and it is also therefore a call on me to help those people and that's what I've been trying to do. Yeah. yeah. So what are some of the things that would occur? What would come to fruition if I, well, what would occur if Brexit actually came to fruition? What would the consequences be societally? Huge. Yeah. Absolutely huge. Because there's a lot more to all of this than meet the eye. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. I think lots of people, both in the USA and in the UK, are beginning to realize that we are in a period where we're not just talking about politics having shifted from sort of center stage or somewhat left sometimes to extreme right with everything that means for people taking away our freedoms and our possibilities in future. It is far further reaching. It has moral implications. It has implications of lack of equality, of people becoming dismissive of others, dehumanizing other people, racism, xenophobia. It is terrifying. It is as if our culture has fallen into the cracks as if we have forgotten how hard it is to build a civilization together where we respect each other and we're kind to each other. And we really need to get down to this and we really need to safeguard our future for our children and our grandchildren. And where can we find the Voices for Europe campaign? Oh, well, again, on Facebook, mm -hmm. Voices for Europe. And you can find my YouTube vid videos, you can find it on Twitter, mm -hmm. which is Voices Europe, at Voices Europe. You, you can find it all over the place. Just Google it and you will find it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Amy, thank you so, thank so, you so much. much. A million thank yous for coming yeah. on. You're very welcome. Thank you. It was a very uh, nice conversation and very good questions. You, thank you, you so know. much. Thanks. Have a thank great you. day. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Perfect. All right, guys. And guys, if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, remember to subscribe. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. Mm -hmm. And wow, that, first of all, that was amazing. It made excellent episode. And next week, guys, we are going to have the former member of the Outlaws, Napoleon, on the show. That's another one that I cannot wait for. One of, my, one of my musical idols. Or just intellectual idols. Intellectual musical idols. I cannot wait. <laughs> so look forward to that. And also, um, it's probably going to be up here. <laughs> I'm going to promote Emmy's channel. You'll see at the very end of this video a little box. And you can find her videos there. Yep. And see you guys next time.